Welcome to Target Market Insights, the multifamily and marketing podcast. Each week, John Kasman interviews multifamily and marketing experts to teach you how to find the best places to invest, attract investors, and grow your portfolio. You are listening to Target Market Insights with your host, John Kasman. Welcome to Target Market Insights, the multifamily marketing show. I'm your host, John Kasman, and I want to thank you for joining us for another great episode. Now, if you're enjoying the show, do me one quick favor and leave us a five-star rating and review. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button so you don't miss an episode. Now, today we're going to be talking to my guy, Carl Sona. Carl Sona began his professional career six years ago in the startup medical device space. His commitment to seeking out his full potential has led to a diverse investment portfolio, including multifamily commercial real estate, equities, and startup companies. Most recently, Carl founded the Free Time Podcast, and he co-founded Streamline Media. Let's welcome to the show, Carl Sona. John, my man, thank you so much for having me on, bro. That introduction killed. <laughs> I'm like, who are they talking about? <laughs> oh, wait, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. My man, Carl, well, listen, it's a pleasure to see you. Good to talk to you. For those absolutely. who don't know, I kind of went really brief on your bio. Why don't you fill in the gaps and take one or two minutes there? Yeah, absolutely, man. I mean, I think you did a good job sort of painting the picture, but you know, I'm, I'm a professional working man. I work with a startup medical device company uh, that specializes in a technology that helps doctors find and diagnose lung cancer earlier. So that's brought me a tremendous amount of fulfillment. But I think somewhere along my third or fourth year in that career, I realized that this whole trading time for money thing wasn't going to be my long-term plan. So I'm talking, man, like I'm on five to six flights a week driving hundreds of miles a day for different appointments, so on and so forth. So I started to wisen up to, um, yeah, the idea of just trading time for money. And that's really what got the investment itch, um, you know, kind of going within me. And, and I just really doubled down on education. I grew up around multifamily. Um, my dad did it in a bit of a smaller scale. And so while I understood it and while I, I liked it, I looked at it as sort of a second job. And again, <laughs> That wasn't, that wasn't going to be part of the plan for me going forward long term in terms of the lifestyle that I was seeking. So really got interested in multifamily two or three years ago when I was dating a girlfriend, an ex-girlfriend whose dad had retired by age 50 and was pretty much able to spend the rest of his days, you know, traveling amongst his four different homes and volunteering his time. And I'm like, wow, like this guy learned how to do large apartments, like maybe this is possible for me. Maybe this isn't just for institutional wealth players. Got into the education space and then um, just really, you know, focused on education. I know I, I came across you at, at one of the, uh, you know, uh, multifamily investment nation uh, summits and and we struck up a great relationship and, and that, that blossomed, man. So I'm proud to say that I'm currently in about 172 doors as a passive investor while I still have a small portfolio in Milwaukee. And um, in addition to that, you mentioned the equities and the startup companies. I do have an investment fund called NGC Capital. So several years ago, several of my buddies and I got together and were like, hey, we could probably leverage each other's networks, our intelligence, and our resources in terms of capital to get into some interesting plays that we wouldn't take on alone. So that is something else that I have currently working on on the side too. So Definitely a very diverse portfolio. Um, you know, my dad being an immigrant of this country always taught me that it was going to be my best interest to not have all my eggs in one basket, man. So I think I've, I've really clutched on to that philosophy. No, man, I love what you said. Just to recap, I mean, you're in the medical device sales, helping people detect yeah. lung cancer early, which, you know, anyone who suffered from that or know people who suffer from that certainly recognize the, the great value and the role you play there. So appreciate yeah. your hard work and efforts there. And then from an investment standpoint, it's funny because it's a tale of two dads, right? You've got your dad who had kind of small multifamily portfolios yeah. and then your ex-girlfriend's dad who had a bigger portfolio and this guy was going around to four different homes uh, throughout the year. So we're going to come back to that. And then you also talked about NGC Capital, which we'll talk about as well, where you actually pulled together some friends to yeah. invest in different types of uh, assets. So going back to the tale of two dads, what do you what did you learn from those two individuals, right? You talked about <laughs> your dad and the small multifamily portfolio, and then kind of the ex-girlfriend's dad. 
who was traveling the world and, and just really having all the free time and, you know, opened up your eyes to the fact that you didn't have to have institutional level capital to really create financial freedom through real estate? Man, that's a great question. And it's interesting that you pose the question around the tale of two dads. I never really thought about it that way. And it, it takes me back to Robert Kiyosaki, rich dad, poor dad. I mean, now that I'm thinking about it from that light, that's exactly what was going on. And, and nothing against my dad. My dad is one of the hardest working guys I know. He came here without a father and really had to uh, make a ton of mistakes in order to find, you know, a more bountiful path. So I don't want to take anything away from him. But what I have learned from him is that working hard is not always working smart. And that's what I learned from my ex-girlfriends that, you know, through putting himself out there and making strategic relationships, he was able to find a way to joint venture to take down some of these larger properties. And um, I've, I've, I've seen what that has translated to in terms of being able to buy his time back in terms of being able to leverage multiple doors over, you know, just a few, right? That ultimately became my dad's second job. And, and because it was my dad's second job, it really became my primary job when I was growing up. So that was the key takeaway there, man. I mean, if you would have talked to me, let's say six years ago, John, when I was just getting out of, out of graduate school, I would have told you, yes, real estate investing definitely makes sense. But I would have told you that the only way to get into it is to do twos and fours and sixes, right? Where you can make sense of getting a residential loan and there's a lower barrier to entry. But knowing what I know now from the rich dad, I would tell you, go big faster. Find find people that you can strategically align yourself with. Find people that are looking at deals such as yourself that have the relationships and figure out what value you can bring, whether it be sweat equity, whether it be capital equity, and, and, and do bigger deals because that is the path to freedom on a bit of a faster trajectory. No, I love that. I appreciate you giving that. And, uh, you know, I know your, your father's worked really hard and it's always one of those things where we love our fathers. Yeah. But, you know, part of the great thing about being a, being a man and becoming your own man is to learn from other men as well and to Amen. recognize that, you know, you, you got your values from your father, but you can also learn some different strategies and techniques from other yeah. people around you. And that's where you get to expand and, you know, make the most of all the access that you have, especially in this world of information where, I mean, you, you know, you have, you have the oh, world man. at your fingertips when it comes to technology and the internet and connections and networking and all those kind of things. So definitely makes sense yeah. to take advantage of that. With that said, I want to talk about NGC Capital. You started talking about yeah. kind of a group of friends that you pulled together to look at investments. Explain that a little bit more and kind of the role NGC Capital plays with your investment decisions. Yeah, man. If I'm being completely honest, it, it's me and eight other friends and, and, and a few members of my family that pulled together. We're all young professionals and we're all like, man, we're making a crap ton of money as W2 employees, but Uncle Sam's grabbing 30, 35, 40% of it. Like, <laughs> what do we do to, 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 to leverage this, this, you know, money that we're making in exchange for our hard earned dollars, sorry, our hard earned, hard earned hours out there in the marketplace? And how do we really pull together more knowledge that is going to help us become more sophisticated investors? So that's really where the premise and the idea started from. And so we got together one Sunday afternoon back in 2016. I'll never forget it. This is when I was living in Atlanta, Georgia. We sat around a conference room table and bro, we literally looked like a deer in headlights. We had no idea what we were going to invest in, how we were going to take positions, what our philosophy was, et cetera. But there's a beautiful thing behind having a desire and or an innate motivation to do something is that to your point, what you just said, John, you go out and you find the knowledge that you're missing, right? You learn the skills that you currently haven't honed or sharpened in order to help you take down um, whatever the opportunity is. And that's where we began, man. The first year was really us just doing our research. It was us really figuring out how to form an organization, how to incorporate it the right way so that we all would have the appropriate shelters in place. And from that point forward, we started going to conferences. We learned about cannabis. We learned about the exciting, the exciting innovations around blockchain technology. We learned about renewable energies. And then we learned about, you know, various startup organizations that we were each being, um, sort of made aware of, right? In our individual networks. And that really became our four vertical pathway as far as NGC capital is concerned is, you know, what we call committee X. That's exciting startup organizations, which we know are very risky and very volatile. But the idea behind the group was, hey, these are not traditional 
investments like a 401k or a Roth IRA that are safe. This is meant to be a little bit more risky, right, for the upside that we're all looking for. So I think we all have a lot more confidence to move towards some of these different opportunities, given the fact that there are eight or nine heads to sort of spread the risk across. Uh, and then it moved into cannabis. We've taken some very exciting positions there. Blockchain, as I mentioned, and renewable energy. So those are the four spaces that we're currently um, you know, active in, in terms of positions that we currently hold. And we're just looking to continue to educate ourselves and, and hopefully use NGC Capital as a template and or a model, right? That other people can can borrow from in their communities to figure out how they actually decrease the wealth gap that a lot of minorities in America currently are oppressed by. So um, there's a nice little philanthropic mission to the organization as well, which really keeps us that much more committed and bought into what we're doing. So you mentioned four verticals. I heard blockchain, cannabis, yep. renewable energy. What was the fourth one? The fourth one. So we call it we call it a committee X. It's startups, okay. startup Got organizations. It. Yep. Okay. Yep. Committee X is that that fourth one there. And as you look at those opportunities, I mean, um, you know, it, it obviously has a, an eye to the future, right? Renewable energy. Correct blockchain technology, cannabis, as we look over the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years, that's where a lot of conversation is taking place. So you all are digging deep into these things, looking into startups. In a way, you've kind of built almost like your your own um, mini venture capitalist type company, right? Where you kind of have your criteria. And you said it took a year to just kind of get everything together as far as documentation and the way the structure is going to work. Yeah. Um, I, I love that you guys have actually formed and done this because, you know, this show is all about, you know, and you, you know me, so this, this whole platform is all about trying to create generational wealth. You know, we love multifamily investing. It's one of the most tried and true ways of creating wealth, of passing wealth on from one generation to the next. And, you know, there's certainly new opportunities to do that as well. So as you are looking at these new kind of emerging platforms, these new emerging uh, industries, there's obviously some inherent risk that are involved there. Um, over the last three or four years as you've been building this with your, your eight cohorts, what are some of the risks that maybe you didn't expect going into it that just kind of came out of either nowhere or just kind of blindsided you that, you know, you would, you would caution someone new looking to jump into the same space? Global pandemics. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I mean. Let's say everything. Hey, yeah. listen, that's all of us right now. But no, I, I think the question is very fair. It's very valid. I'm happy you asked. You know, I, one of the risks I would say is know what you're investing in. You know, going back to the blockchain thing, fortunately, three out of the eight members on the team um, have a very broad and, 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 and deep knowledge basis on blockchain technology. Actually, one of our founding members builds computers that mine some of these alternative coins into um, the current, uh, I guess, ledger, if you want to call it. So we, we had a very good knowledge base there, but we saw a lot of our cohorts and counterparts getting in on Bitcoin and Ethereum, you know, when they were spiking back in 2017 just sort of chasing the rave, you right? It was, it was a new trend. It was, it was supposed to create millionaires overnight. And shortly thereafter, some of those coins came crashing down. So I would really encourage people to really have a sophisticated level of knowledge behind what they're getting into. All of our investments in those four verticals are highly vetted. All of them go through stringent due, due diligence processes that span a week and a half period. We even bring on... Um, certified professionals to give us counsel and advice before we take any position. So I can't stress that. Don't chase uh, the, sign, the shiny object because nine times out of 10, I feel like it's going to bite you in the butt. So that's the first thing. As it relates to the stock market, we have learned a lot about options and, and some other exciting instruments that help us leverage our capital. In the beginning, <laughs> we were tying up so much capital, right, towards some of these individual stock plays. And we quickly realized that we were actually taking so much out of reserves that when new exciting opportunities came up, we didn't have the capital to fund them because they were currently tied up. So we, we've learned to make smarter bets through leveraging capital with instruments like options trading, et cetera, that isn't so capital intensive on the front end. You know, an option you can buy for 
a few dollars and, and it helps you take a position in a particular equity versus actually buying the stock itself where let's say Amazon's trading at $2,200 or whatever it is, you actually have to pull $2,200 of, of, of hard money to buy one share, right? Like the upside or the, re the return on investment really isn't there. So things like that, we had to learn the hard way, I would say in the first 18 months of our existence, but we've really dialed it in since then. And sometimes you gotta make those mistakes, but again, I can't stress education enough and I can't stress finding people online that are doing what it is you wanna do and finding a way to add value to them so that you can learn how they do what they do. That's been a big uh, recipe to our success. Yeah, I mean, listen, everything you're saying, even with the options, I mean, that's something yeah. that I think goes over most people's heads, right? They just, right. unless you really get into stocks and investing at that level, it's kind of a complicated, you know, concept to understand. And, you know, your point on really focusing on due diligence and not chasing kind of that shiny object. Those are, you know, obviously very core fundamentals for investing. Mm -hmm. And I think it kind of reigns true whether you're investing in multifamily stocks, blockchain or whatever. Um, as right. you were talking, you know, the, the one thing I was thinking about was, um, you know, as you look at merging industries, it's regulation. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, but whether it be blockchain, whether it be cannabis, whether it be, you know, startups, it's what's going to happen from a regulatory standpoint, because, you know, uh, laws can be passed at any moment that could, you know, crush a business model or right. continue, you know, really have an impact or shift the dynamics of something. So in that space, and I think pretty much, you know, especially re renewable energy as well. So pretty much all of the industries, all the, the platforms you all are playing in regulations kind of seem to play a, a pretty significant role as far as either hindering growth or somehow changing the trajectory of your investment. How often are you taking a look at what's happening, what the buzz is from Congress and just kind of maybe even some of the, um, the lobbyist groups and what's happening from those industries as far as where things may fall from a regulatory perspective? Yeah, that's a great question. So I would say we meet once a week and 30 minutes of our hour and a half long meeting is solely dedicated towards education. What's new and emerging information that we need to keep top of mind before we ever take a position in any company or in any exciting opportunity. We're also heavily vetting, uh, the key players, right? That are on the board of directors or that are on the leadership team. We really, really look to ensure that there's a solid track record there and that these people that are, are you know, leading the ventures that we're looking and taking a position in actually have a solid thesis in terms of the space and a solid plan in terms of regulation because that can quickly squash your position. So we like to see that there's a track record that the leadership team has done similar type ventures uh, in the past. No different from multifamily. When you're talking with you know a principal or a sponsor in a deal, you'd like to ensure that that individual that you're getting ready to go to the, into the trenches with has has actually seen enough situations and or scenarios so that they can plan accordingly. Right. So that's all part of due diligence. Nothing's ever done hastily, and it goes back to my previous point. You know, we learn very quickly on not to just chase a, sh a shiny penny because often. Oftentimes, you're going to lose focus, you're going to lose sight of the vision, which is to you know, create generational wealth, and you're probably going to be knocked out, out, of, out of the game. And as Rod Cleave says, man, dabbers get crushed, right? <laughs> we, we don't want to get crushed. We want to be able to have longevity in this game. So education is huge. Again, I, I just can't, I can't, I probably sound like a broken record, bro, but I can't overemphasize that. Well, I think it's an important thing, right? Just not jumping in because you get excited. You have to take your time. You have to educate yourself. You have to surround yourself with people right. who are going to help lift you from an education standpoint. And the thing I love and the reason I want to make sure this this point is made is the fact that it's it's really group investing and the group dynamics of pooling resources together. And anyone listening to this, you know, that's the thing about syndication from a multifamily standpoint. It's the yeah. same thing. It's about pooling resources together to go out and acquire larger apartment buildings because I can run out and buy, you know, maybe a 20 unit building by myself and you might be to get a 20 unit and whatever. But to bring 10, 15, 20 people together, now we can go out and buy something that is larger or we can hire professional management we can, you know, hire professional contractors and just really make it a business and run it like a smooth, well-oiled machine 
versus going back to kind of the way your your dad was doing it initially, where you built a portfolio, but you got to maintain it. You got to go out there and do it. And the fact that you guys have done this, not just in real estate, but also have re- really focused on emerging platforms, emerging industries. I think it's something that a lot of people listening to this, if you've been interested in investing in any of the things that Carl is talking about, the cannabis industry, blockchain or, or Bitcoin or Ethereum, you know, those kind of um, altcoins, that, that space right there. If you're thinking about renewable energy, if you're looking at startups, you w- wish you would have got into, you know, uh, uh, Uber or something like that. You know, this is a way to start doing it. And you may have friends or people in your network right now that are feeling the same way, that are making money, don't really know what to invest in. And it would be a great opportunity for you to reach out to them and kind of really take what Carl has done and what Carl has laid out with his group and see how you might be able to replicate some of that. So it's just really powerful things. And I really think it's very insightful. And the more we can work together, the easier it's going to be to have success versus trying to do it by yourself, which is what most people do. Most people just, they get their 401k or their retirement plan set up. They, you know, make their contributions, whatever that is, 10%, whatever. And that's their whole plan. They don't really get into, you know, where the world is going, where the future opportunities are and how they can be involved in it. So these are great, insightful pieces that I think can really help our investors, whether you are strictly in a multifamily or you're looking at alternative investment opportunities, this is some great insight as far as ways to progress and move things forward. Absolutely. Yeah. So Carl, you have uh, also launched the Free Time Podcast. I want to know what sparked you to launch this podcast and tell me a little bit more about it. Yeah, it's a great question, man. A couple years ago when I was living in Nashville, um, I had come into probably the most amount of money that I made at the time that if you would have told me just a year prior, I'd been like, no, like that, that's not possible as a working professional. Right. And, um, I wasn't doing much John at that time to learn about tax shelters and to learn about, you know, different investment opportunities. That's right. When I started learning about multifamily and NGC was on its precipice, but I, I wasn't really taking a lot of proactive measure and action in my free time to learn how to protect some of the riches, if you will, that I was coming into, man. And I just very quickly saw the writing on the wall. I was like, hey, this is that carrot that society would lead you on to believe uh, that you somehow made it in life. You know, you're making a couple hundred thousand dollars a year. You're living in, you know, the, the awesome spot in the city center. You're driving this, like you've made it relax, rest in your laurels. And and I was doing that for probably a period of four to five months when I was like, uh-uh, must I go down this slope? You know, my parents worked way too hard for me to be in this position to where I'm at now and to not find a way to actually take it to a new dimension. And that's when I got really clear with auditing how I was spending my time, John, and I wasn't proud of myself. I mean, it was like I was going to work and I was showing up and making deals and doing all the things I was supposed to do from a career standpoint, but I wasn't really doing much from a personal development and or growth standpoint. And that's when I fell in love with podcasts. You know, again, traveling a lot. You, you, you think about net time in the car or even on the airplane and you ask yourself, all right, I've listened to this same future album on repeat 10 times. <laughs> Maybe it's time to go ahead and plug in Target Market Insights or some of these other shows where I can be introduced to people that are outside of my current network that can feed me some intelligence that I don't currently have. And that's where it started for me. And I started building my portfolio on the side. I started building my personal brand on the side. And I would have young professionals that I work with or that are in other corporate organizations come to me and be like, man, like, how are you doing so much? And I was, I always ask them, like, what are you doing in your spare time? You know, and it'd be like, oh, chilling, going to the bar, chasing girls. And everybody's always talking about where it is they want to go in life. You know, everybody's talking about being financially free and having all the time in the world to live a lifestyle by design. But nobody realizes that how you spend your time right now can very quickly compound towards helping you live that life, right? And specifically young people, there is this idea that they're just going to walk into their mid thirties and things are going to be perfectly as they dream. And it doesn't work that way. And I saw that within myself. So I was like, all right, I'm using my free time now to cultivate better habits that will help springboard me into some of these awesome things that I want out of life. And that's what the free time podcast is all about. I'm having guests on the show that have done incredible things 
uh, in their spare time, you know, that people would, would ooh and ah at. And we're just going into some of the fundamentals as to how they created those things. And typically, it's looking at time as an asset. So I'm very, very passionate about it, specifically for young people, because there's a lot of awesome opportunities out there, provided you discipline yourself and you put yourself in position to capitalize. Man, that's powerful insights right there about yeah. understanding how you use your time. Uh, I love the fact that you did a, a, your own personal audit and you didn't get caught up in the trap of Got success and, and what the vision of success is, especially when you're in corporate America, because it's very easy to do that. I mean, like you said, you get yeah. the, the house or the apartment you want, condo in the middle of the city, nightlife, got the clothes, yeah. you got the car, you got the girl, you got everything you want. Um, but recognizing that your parents worked so hard that they didn't work hard for you to have these material things. They worked right. hard for you to actually push it forward for generations. So I love the fact that you really kind of recognized that, caught yourself, took a step back and figured out ways to, to push yourself forward. You know, yeah. you, you talked about your friends and colleagues saying that you, you how do you do so much? I got to ask the same question. You know, I, I know that you obviously have some free time, but you know, you're, you're very active on online uh, with Instagram, yeah. with the podcast. We haven't even gotten to your latest venture right now, Streamline Media, which I want to talk about in a moment. But how do you manage kind of your schedule and your free time to make sure that you know, you're, you're present, you, you're building your brand, you're building your connections, yeah. you're doing all the things there, but also that you're able to enjoy life and spend the time with your, your family and your, your, your girlfriend and doing the things that you really want right. to do. It's been a work in progress, John. I, I can't claim to have it all figured out, but what I can tell you is that every month I have a whiteboard session or I, it's just me by myself. I spend about an hour, hour and a half outlining what the core objectives are for the following month. Mm -hmm. And then once I had those objectives set, it's typically three to five objectives. Um, I heard once that it takes somewhere on average 21 days to start to embed a new habit, right? I work on five core competencies that I need to practice every single day. Five simple things that help push me towards that objective. So if it's content creation on Instagram to build a personal brand, you know, what are, what are three things that I can pull out of my day to help document you know, how I interact with life and what my current process is that I can create content around. If it's a multifamily investment opportunity, what are three things that I need to do, uh, you know, over the course of this week to level up my education, to level up my network in terms of talking to new people, or just to continue to look at deals. I mean, I look at old OMs just to keep, you know, my mind sharp in terms of how to actually break down a deal. So I, I have a decent level of knowledge when a new one does come across my desk. You see what I'm saying? When it comes to Streamline Podcast, which we'll talk about here in a second, what are three to five core conversations I need to have on a daily basis to start to scale that business up? I'm just really trying to simplify it on myself. I find that um, the resistance threshold is, is much lower on me when I can keep things simple. I'm like, I can just dial in on staying consistent on achievable actions on a daily basis. So... On the outside, it, it may look like so many massive things are happening, you know, on a daily basis. But in my mind, small, actionable, you know, execution, executions is what lead to, to, to long-term compounding um, massive events. So I'm just focused on the day-to-day, -day, man. I'm just trying to chase perfect days. And that's just achieving my, my, my core three to five things that ultimately help me towards my monthly objective. So that's how I've broken it down. And that process is, is currently serving me. What I've learned, I recently moved to my girlfriend. What I've learned is that in addition to some of the professional endeavors, it's also important to keep some of the personal endeavors uh, in line. You know, so we've gotten into a variety of little tips where she feels like I'm working too much and I'm not spending as much time with her. And so I've started even scheduling in that personal time just to keep the relationship fresh, to keep our our connection nice and strong and keep it developing, you know, along the path that I hope that it goes. So I would definitely encourage everybody, you know, that balance is key. I'm not a hustle, hustle or a grind, grind, grind kind of guy. I feel like that very quickly leads you to a burnout. And so take the time as you would in your professional life to schedule in, you know, periods of rest and relaxation, because it's, it's so, it's so fundamental to your ability to keep on going along this marathon that we're all running. Yeah, man, I love that. What I heard yeah. you say was uh, small actions consistently are yeah. helping you lead to compounding success over the long haul. Um, and I think that's very powerful and, and not just focusing on the business, the money and that kind of stuff, but also understanding 
What do you want in your personal yeah. life? What are the results that you're looking for? Um, with that said, I do want to talk about Streamline Media because you and I connected over this recently over the last couple of weeks, and I'm really excited for this platform. And I, I told you that I wish you had this when I was launching <laughs> my show right. because I went through a couple of different resources to help me out getting the show going. And I know a lot of podcasters out there or folks who are looking to start a podcast, they're trying to figure out what to do. And I get the same questions, right? What kind of mic to use? Like, what do you use for hosting and things like that? But what I don't get a lot of questions of, and it's the thing that most people really struggle with, is how do you actually get into the production? You know, it's the back end mm -hmm. stuff, it's pushing out the episodes. And if you're doing it weekly or every day or whatever the cadence is, it can be really yeah. challenging. So talk to me about Streamline Media and what led you to start this process. Yeah, man, it really started out of a uh, frustration that I was shouldering for several months um, shortly after I launched my podcast. The thing about podcasting is that it's such an exciting space. It's such a great platform to get content out there. And I think we're seeing a huge spike of people running towards the podcasting arena. But what they don't tell you up front is how much is required in the back end, right? In order to put out a decently sounding um, finished product that people are actually going to engage with, right? And that's our whole goal is engagement. I, I don't care what your space or what your niche is. And that's what I was running up against, man, is that I wanted to be very, very intentional about the sound quality and the notes and the graphics so that I could start to grow this thing organically. But I quickly realized that in order to do that, it was going to cost a whole boatload of money. And at least for me, I don't know about your listeners, John, or I don't know about you. My plan wasn't to monetize the podcast upfront, meaning I'm not a professional podcaster. I do other things for money. This is just a platform for me to put more information out there. So I, I couldn't make sense of spending eight, nine hundred dollars a month for some of these services on you know a platform that I'm not making any money on, and um, it led me to you know editing my own show for a while, which very quickly became a huge time sucker, and then it led me to even the freelancer and VA approach, which is not a bad approach at all, provided you can find, you know, good freelancers and good BAs, but I just wasn't really any good at that. So I was getting inconsistent turnaround times, poor quality, to the point where, you know, I went to a group of friends that were in a mastermind with me that was centered around podcasts. And I was like, guys, like, are you all, are y'all running into these issues? Or is it just me? And sure enough, they were my three other partners, they were. And so we put our heads together. And we were like, all right, we think we can figure out a way to provide excellent top-notch quality to the market, you know, that keeps podcasters podcasting, but keeps their wallets still full. You know, we, we found a way to, to find a, a, a true tangible solution that provide next level quality with cost-effective pricing. And, and that really is the premise of our business model, man. And, and we're so happy about it because it's allowed podcasters that are busy working professionals to not worry about the day-to-day. All they have to do is literally hit record, focus on engaging with their guests if it's an interview show and produce quality content that's going to provide value, which is a lot of the reason why people come into podcasting, you know, and not to mention there's something to be said for having to cultivate your voice in the microphone. Like there, there, there's a lot that really uh, is required to get you to a level that you'd like to grow into. So our goal is to have people focus on the mic and really build, you know, that comfortability and and we handle the rest from an editing standpoint, show notes standpoint, and even social media graphics standpoint. So it's been a lot of fun, John. No, I mean, listen, it's a great service because to your point, I mean, that frustration you felt, yeah. it's one that I felt. And I know, you know, I started this show back in 2017, towards uh, okay. summer 2017. And at that time, you know, I reached out to my colleagues, my peers who had shows and um, they shared their, their resources and we used a firm that focuses only on editing podcasts. Um, and they were, they were good starting out, um, but I had challenges there. Um, and the, the cost really came into play because they only did the edit. You know, I still had to do the show notes. I still had to do any right. kind of graphics. All they would do is edit the audio content. Right. And I still had to do everything else. I still had to publish it. I still had to figure out hosting and everything else. And as you get more and more services, the price definitely shoots up. And like you said, I didn't monetize the show starting out. And even now, we really work through, you know, I mean, we have our ads are basically companies we're affiliated with or, or partners we really trust and, and partner with, but we don't necessarily get a, a big paycheck from from advertisers or things like that. So it's tough to sit there and say, all right, I'm going to spend, 
you know, a few thousand dollars a year, five, you know, five, six, seven thousand dollars a year on a podcast that may net me zero dollars, right? right? So, um, not to mention the the time suck. I mean, it could be a, right. a a really difficult thing if you don't love all the other aspects. I mean, I certainly enjoy talking to people, and I, I assume most people who launch podcasts they enjoy the interviews, the the conversations with people. But the back end editing, the show notes, right, and everything right. else, that takes up a lot of time and is a challenge for most people. Yeah. And I think it's the number one reason why as many people as you see running towards podcasts, you see exponentially more than ever make it past episode nine into the double digits is because the time sunk in some of these different, you know, um, aggravations really start to build up on themselves and people just slowly stop making content. And it's a shame because I really do feel like people that are attracted to podcasts are generally good people. You know, the, the, the stats will, will show and confirm that people that listen to podcasts are really interested in personal development. They're, they're, they're high achievers. They're high earners, all these different things, right? And so that leads me to believe that they actually have something good to say or share. And the fact that, you know, the majority of people never make it past episode nine that saddens me because it, it makes me feel as though the ro- the world is being robbed of, yeah. of a lot of good information that could be disseminated if we could just find systems and processes that made sense. So that's our whole goal is to keep podcasters podcasting. Well, listen, I, I know you're doing a great job of doing that. I know a few folks that you've, you're talking to and working with right now. And uh, if yeah. anyone's listening and they're interested in joining or learning more about Streamline Media, I'll certainly make sure we put a a link in our show notes where you can reach out to Carl and his team, learn a little bit more about the services, and maybe it can help save you some time and some money on your podcast. With that said, Carl, speaking of that, speaking of that, actually, uh, I do have a special promo code that I'll share with your audience. So if they go to streamlinepodcast.com and they find whatever package they'd like to get started with, enter in promo code Carl, that's capital K-A-R-L, to save 15% off your first month. So we'd be happy to do that for your audience, John. I love that. Thank you for offering that up. So if you go to Streamline Podcast, which we'll link to on the show notes, and use promo code Carl, he's going to give you 15% off. So definitely make sure you check that out. It's a great service. Carl's a good friend as well. So you'll definitely want to check that out and uh, see if it can help you. With that said, we're going to move on to our bullseye round. You ready, Carl? Love it. Love it. Let's do it, man. Give me a failure or an apparent failure that set you up for later success. Oh man, not making it to medical school. <laughs> now I sell to doctors and I'm able to do all the amazing things that I do on the side. <laughs> all right, name a digital or mobile resource you recommend for your business. We are so in love with Trainual. Um, talk about being able to clone yourself when it comes to educating your employees on systems and processes. I mean, this takes the old employee handbook and tosses that in the garbage and really takes it to a new modern era, right? That really helps you train your people so that you can function effectively. So training was amazing. Give me a book that you've recommended or gifted the most in the last year. Uh, Definitely by far the 5 a.m. club by Robin Sharma. Give me a daily habit that helps you stay focused on your goals getting up at 5 a.m. and taking that first hour of time to uh, solely focus on myself with meditation, with some quick movement, and with some reading. What's one thing you know now that you wish you knew when you were starting out? That multifamily really is achievable for the common man. All right, you are in Denver, and I mean, you told us that you lived in Atlanta at one point, you lived in Nashville. I know at some yeah. point you had to live in Milwaukee too, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so I'm gonna, let's focus on Denver right now, but if there is another place that you've been to, certainly chime in, but give me the best place to grab a bite in Denver. John, when you come up, I'm taking you to the African Grill. Uh, okay. My good my good friend, Mama Ose Fardua, she's the one that owns it. She has two locations. She just opened up a brand new one here by me in town and went out by the airport. So uh, it's amazing. They're from Ghana originally, and they make the best homemade pepper soup. Uh, that is my favorite go-to, especially after I've had a long week, man. I'm typically heading there and uh, and, and getting that delivered actually these days with, with COVID going on. So African Grill in Denver, by far the most delicious stuff you'll ever have. 
All right, African Grill will definitely make sure that's on the list. Yep. We get to Denver fairly, I mean, fairly regularly. I mean, it's one of the cities we, we go to at least annually. So we'll yeah. definitely make sure we check that out next time we're in town. So Carl, a lot of great information today, man. I really enjoy talking to you, hearing a little bit more about your story, the two dads and how they influence your view on multifamily investing, the way you use kind of group economics to partner with your friends and family to identify the best investment opportunities, especially yep. taking advantage of kind of emerging industry emerging areas so you all can kind of help create generational wealth for the next generation there and then really just the way you got into podcasting your free podcast a free time podcast we'll make sure we link to that in the show notes as well as well as what you're doing with streamline podcast to help other people really get more efficient in how they use their time so they can focus on creating content as opposed to editing and every other thing on the back end that it takes to make people find and engage with your your podcast. Carl, for listeners who want to get in touch with you and a follow-up, what are the best ways to reach out? Definitely my website. It'll be live here in the next few weeks. That's carlsona.com. And that's K-A-R-L-S-O-N-A.com. I'm also very active on Instagram. And the handle there is at K-A-R-L.S-O-N-A. A. And last but not least, I take calls all the time for Streamlined. If you're interested at all in the services and how we may be able to assist you, just go to streamlinepodcast.com and you, you can book a free call anytime. Carl, thanks again for coming on Target Market Insights, the multifamily marketing show. Look forward to talking to you again soon. Take you care. got it, John. Thank you, bro.